In this week's update, how strong are markets? What are the best type of stocks to buy? Gold stocks poised to run and Bitcoin steady, but my name's Gary Davis. And as always, this is general advice in this uh, particular video. And please remember to like and subscribe to the video. All right, we'll start with some market perspective as, uh, as usual, as is really important. And um, it, it's been playing out over the last month pretty much as it often does. And I've been observing over the last three or four weeks, and that is we get a good run into uh, the start of earnings season. Uh, Wall Street understands where the earnings growth is, and those stocks get bought up ahead of time. And so we often see this dynamic where prices of uh, the better growth stocks run up um, into uh, into the earnings, and then they they sell off once the earnings are announced. And less experienced people in the market see the share price selling off after a terrific earnings result and scratch their head and wonder what the heck's going on. Well, all the all the buying and all the profit um, making has been done before the event, and it's playing out very much in a similar way. Uh, we've seen uh, terrific breakouts from. Uh, Amazon continued strong um, runs from Microsoft. Uh, there was a breakout from Apple overnight. So the large cap tech stocks are, uh, are doing very well. But look, the landscape is shifting to a degree. And we are moving into uh, a fairly historically seasonally weak period of the year. So once this uh, burst of strength leading into earnings season is, is done with, then um, I think it gets it gets harder for markets after that. So gro if you look at global growth around all the major economies, it may not go it may not slow down, but it probably can't get any better. So I think global growth appears to have to have peaked. So it's either going to hold at this level or more likely, the growth rate is going to slow. Now, that doesn't mean that growth goes backwards. It just means that the, the rate of growth um, will start to become a smaller positive percentage. And, you know, that's, that's generally a time when you, you need to keep an eye on, on, uh, on stocks that things don't deteriorate too quickly. The second area is that central bank stimulus and interest rates can probably only go the wrong way. For stocks now, again, that's not to say that it will. It may hold at these levels. Interest rates may stay roughly where they are, and levels of government stimulus may stay roughly where they are. But I don't think they're going to get any better for stocks than what they are at the moment. So, in a sense, we're we're sort of at a at a bit of a peak. Doesn't mean there's going to be any sort of dramatic fall off. In fact, I don't think there will be. I think there might be some just general profit taking, just the normal two or three steps forward, one step back sort of process. I think that's the most likely outcome. But I just want everyone to recognize that, you know, wh where it is at the moment is probably about as good as it gets. And we, you know, we just need to be smarter and faster and quicker from here in, uh, in how we uh, interact with the market. So how do we deal with a still positive environment, which I, which it is and which I think will continue? It'll still remain positive, but where equity prices uh, are still high. Um, so that's, you know, that's the trick. And you can't just buy any old stock because a lot of stocks, uh, particularly the stocks that did well from November to uh, March, April, the reopening stocks, you know, they're going to start to struggle in this sort of environment because a lot of the good news has now been priced in. So selection has never been more critical than it is now. Selection is always important, but never more so than now, where we've got this uh, this mix of peak everything, um, including prices and valuations. So um, you just need to be very uh, very careful and very selective about what you choose. For me, the the obvious answer is that you want to go where the strongest growth is and where the most highly probable growth is. And if you stay in that area, then you're going to be on reasonably safe ground. It doesn't insulate you from volatility, but it gives you the best chance of growing your money over the medium to longer term. 
And then it's just a matter of managing the rotations, both within sectors and industry groups and between sectors. And I guess that has been the toughest change this year compared to 2020. 2020, uh, the technology sector just absolutely blasted off and pretty much anything in that sector went up. So it was relatively easy. There wasn't much in the way of rotations and you just jumped on board the train and away you went. But now we're getting rotations that are getting increasingly more frequent. And that makes it difficult because, you know, you, it takes a few weeks to be sure that we've got a rotation from one sector into a new one. Uh, but then it, it doesn't run for very long and it, and it rotates back again. And I think that's going to be the way the landscape is going forward. So it just means you've got to be more and more um, clear and defined in the parts of the market that, um, that you're working with. So what could go wrong? What are the risks? Well, there's several geopolitical risks out there. I think the one that is probably the most severe, I don't know whether it will come to pass in the next 12 months or so, but the one that I think is increasingly looking inevitable is conflict over Taiwan, and that could be really nasty. Um, but there are several other geopolitical events that could just change the landscape very, very quickly. And of course, the other one that I've been talking about all year is um, is just central bank policy error. They've, um, they've stretched the balloon to breaking point, and they want to make sure that they don't make any mistakes because there's, um, there's a heck of a lot riding on the policy stance that they've maintained over um, since March of 2020, and if they um, if they misstep with uh, with policy, then um, you know it could get nasty. Now, what criteria are essential when you're looking at stock selection? I think the products and the services that the stocks provide have got to be in unquestionably high demand. Demand that is not really tied to central bank policy. It's, um, it's uh, demand that is basically driven by society, by technological change, by what people want to buy. And those products and services have also got to beat the pants off the competition. So the stocks that are going to do best, the stocks where you can make a very good return with a relatively low risk in absolute terms, are the ones that have got a very significant competitive advantage and their, their customers just love them. So as I said earlier, they must also be in step with the mega trends of which there are, you know, there are four or five mega trends and, and all the societal drivers that, that are out there. So if you can get that combination, I think you're in pretty good territory. And of course, the thing that makes it all work, you know, no, none of this works with with uh, poor to average management. You need highly competent management. And there are, there are a couple of fundamental indicators that you can use to, um, to determine just how good management is. All right, let's turn to American stocks now. Um, the S&P finished um, strongly on Friday. Uh, it was down for most of the week, a shortened week. Um, but it ended up gaining 0.4%, but a very strong finish. I think the S&P was up around 1.3% on uh, on Friday night. Um, a, a very, very positive finish. It's very clear that the aggressive sectors are clearly back in leadership mode. Um, XLK, XLV, XLY, uh, so technology, healthcare, consumer discretionary are clearly back leading and this is what was really leading in in 2020 as well. So we've we've come full circle now, back to those uh, those sectors. That's about earnings. Uh, we're almost to the seasonally weakest two months of the year. Uh, from the third week, once uh, once we get to options expiry in July, uh, we're the first week into earnings season. Um, you know, most of the good news is starting to get out there, and. Um, and stock prices are going to struggle from here towards the end of September. So, look, it doesn't always work out that way, and it doesn't mean that some stocks can't continue to rise, and they always do. It's just there's far less of them. 
So this is not a time to panic and think you've got to get out of the market. It's just a time to be really, really clear about you know what you own and how you're managing it because um, the next couple of months are, um, are going to test investors' resolve, that's for sure. US dollar uh, eased a little bit down to 92.13. The 10-year yield is still on the decline. I mean, who would have thought when the yield moved from 0.5 after COVID to 1.75 um, towards the end of 2020, um, that um, you know we would start to start to decline again, and we're back down to 1.35. Uh, really quite extraordinary, and it's um, it's really just defying um, the the logical direction of markets. But it is what it is. The VIX, which had been running in the low 15s last week. Uh, spiked up to 20 when there was a bit of a mid uh, midweek sell-off, um, bit of a panic around um, the continued um, state of emergency in Japan, um, South Korea increasing their lockdowns, and of course uh, the situation with lockdowns here in Australia. Um, so we saw the VIX spike up to 20, um, but then came all the way back off again on Friday and finished in the low 16s. Let's look at some charts. So we'll start first of all, oh, Bitcoin, um, no real change. You can see we've, we're really just moving sideways, but very much towards the lower end of this uh, band between 30,000 and 40,000. And um, if you're playing the odds, the odds are that this is a massive head and shoulders pattern. And if this level, this neckline here breaks, then we're looking for a significant move to the downside. That may or may not occur. Um, and look, to be honest, head and shoulders patterns are less reliable than inverse head and shoulders patterns. You know, that's that's a much more uh, productive pattern. But um, certainly at the moment, you'd have to say that um, that Bitcoin is is looking weaker rather than stronger. All right, there's the S and P. You can see um, sell off on uh, on Thursday. Uh, but we that all occurred at the start of the session. We then turned around, closed on the highs, and followed through very nicely on Friday to a new all-time high at um, 43.70. Um, quite amazing. Uh, Nasdaq also very strong. Uh, we we actually had a high on Wednesday, um, but uh, this was the uh, all-time highest closing high. On the Nasdaq, so things still looking extremely positive there. Uh, small caps did suffer a little bit, so small caps are, are off the pace a little bit with respect to the other American indices. Uh, if we look at um, the US dollar, it's really just in a big size sideways pattern, and that's that's really where it's been since uh, since November. So no real direction there on the US dollar. And I do note that the Australian dollar is is weaker than than the, the strength in the US dollar would indicate. So we've got lower highs, lower lows. We've broken a key support level. Uh, the Australian dollar, whether you like it or not, is clearly in downtrend. It's great if you've got holdings in America. The um, those holdings are becoming more and more valuable as the Australian dollar declines. Turning to Aussie stocks, um, the dollar fell um, to 74.51, did kick up a bit on Friday night, but but still in decline. The ASX 200 ended up down 0.5%, uh, um, and healthcare was really the main culprit dragging the Australian market down. Precious metals, uh, gold was up uh, $21 to 18.09, so looking quite good. And from a sentiment point of view and from a, a positioning point of view, and if you look at the outflows out of the gold uh, ETFs, uh, traders are giving up. There, there is a clear, um, a clear exodus from the market uh, after several weeks of lower prices when things were looking like they were about to break out. The, the typical reaction in the market is, uh, is occurring and, and traders that don't really understand how the dynamics work, particularly in the precious metals market, are giving up, and that's excellent news for um, 
for those that uh, that are bullish on gold. 1690 is still possible. It's getting less likely, I think. Um, but the long-term macro outlook remains very positive for gold. So that really hasn't changed. The other thing that has we've now got to a point where the futures positioning is now bullish. Most of the selling has been done, which is what normally happens. The futures market doesn't take long to sell off. The leverage is so high that um, that speculators can't afford very much of a move. So they've pretty much liquidated their long positions. Um, and, uh, and it's really quite a bullish setup now in the, in the futures market. It won't take much to, um, to trigger that turn up. If we look at uh, precious metal stocks, GDX, GDX typically fluctuates between 80% and 150% of its 200-day moving average. So down at 80 is generally super, super bullish. Generally, you've got very little downside risk and you've got significant upside. And when it gets above 130, 140%, then um, you, know, you want to be looking at locking in profits. Right at the minute, we're currently sitting at 92%. So we're um, almost to the bottom of that typical band that, uh, that applies for, for GDX. So that means the GDX is oversold. Doesn't mean that it's going to move up immediately. Um, and it could go a little bit lower in the short term. But the risk reward now for the sector is far more appealing than it was a month ago. So let's take a look at some of those charts. I'll just quickly um, look at the ASX 200. So most of the selling occurred on, on Friday. Things were looking very buoyant on Thursday until we got that selling in, uh, in other Asian exchanges. And then, um, and then we, you know, we got some selling on Friday. But you note that it did... Uh, it did finish well off the lows on uh, on Friday, so obviously some some buying came in. But if we look at um, if we look at gold on a daily basis, you can see it was a pretty positive week. We went up virtually every session uh, last week, and if we look on the weekly chart, um, you can see quite positive. Silver still not really doing anything and it's starting to lose ground. Silver had been outperforming gold, but uh, that has sort of flipped around a little bit now. Just some other charts that are really, uh, really important that I look at um, all the time. Um, this is consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. You know, what one of two really important charts that you want to follow. And when, um, you know, when things are looking um, when things are looking really positive with respect to um, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, then the general market is doing pretty well. And if you go back and look at um, look at the situation that we had leading into twenty um, into two thousand and seven, you can see that this um, this spread, um, and I think I might have shown this chart last week. You can see that this really peaked out and went sideways uh, between 2004 and we got a breakdown in 2006. Um, so that was that was nearly 15, 16 months ahead of the ultimate high in the um, in the S and P. So you, you got more than a year's warning, and then of course the, the breakdown, the the break of this. Um, of this support level here, that occurred um, ag again in August of 2007, and the definitive breakdown, which took out this swing low, uh, occurred in October of 2007. So again, still, you know, but basically at the same time that the S&P peaked. So watching this ratio is really important for the direction of the of the whole market. And if you look at where we are at the moment on this spread. And you can see that we're in a pretty bullish position at the moment, not showing any signs. We've had a consolidation, but certainly this is not the sort of environment that marks major tops. And of course, the other key one is uh, is the Russell 1000 growth versus, versus value. We've now um, had a very, very strong uptrend since um, early June. So it's been running now for about five or six weeks. And, um, you know, we're certainly back 
uh, up into the, the top of the range. So that means growth stocks very much back in favour. So I think overall for the precious metals market, um, I don't know if it's about to happen right away, but it is certainly poised to run higher. And I think the risk reward, the, the potential for downside is far less than the potential for upside. Looking at other commodities, uh, copper was pretty much steady, just really moving with the currency. But nickel was stronger again, almost back to $8.50. We've, we've had a basically a burst of profit taking. We'd had a, a tremendous run in base metals and that had to cool off a little bit. Um, that looks now as though it's complete and the long-term outlook is still very positive for, um, for base metals. Uh, crude oil, uh, which got up almost to 78, um, ended up a bit lower, 74 and a half on the week. So the rally ran into resistance around that 77, 78 mark. And, um, and now we, we're in for a period of consolidation. Um, it's, you know, it's hard to know what the bottom of that band will be. Um, but um, certainly we're, we're going to see some consolidation for a period and particularly so if the US dollar moves up. So there's the spot copper chart, pretty much sideways. Nickel did, did make some gains and almost back to its, um, its long-term high. Wrapping it up, I think from here on in, expect volatility. It would be highly unusual if we don't get uh, plenty of volatility. And I think you need to train yourself to think like a contrarian. You don't want to be with the crowd in this sort of market. Um, it's just going to be very dangerous. But just being a contrarian for the sake of it and just going against anything that's out of favour is, is not likely to be productive. You need to be very targeted towards the high probability growth that I talked about on the first slide. Um, I think if that is where the best risk uh, adjusted returns um, are, are going to be found. Portfolio analyst last week did a pretty extensive general market review and, uh, and presented some more trading opportunities. And there's always trading opportunities, no matter what's going on. There are lots and lots of them. So um, I think it was another pretty good session. That's it for this week. Those that want more information, it's on our website. There's my email address. And I'll be back with you next week. Cheers.